on. This morning in our Sunday morning discussion group, we were talking about scriptures and how people could read the scripture and get an entirely different interpretation from the reading of that scripture and how often we differ among individuals as well as we do among faith traditions. It made me think about how often in a reading of the scripture and preparing for sermons we can read it and we can think of it in different terms and this is a particularly good example on this scripture because it could be easily preached from a terrible point of view of the slaughter of the innocents and how terrible things were or it can be preached from just the opposite point of view that perhaps what others do for evil as one of the scriptures says God does for good and evil can be seen in all things if we look for it and so can good and the lesson today has a particular meaning for me 15 years ago on this Sunday I began my beginning stages of my ministry I was going to seminary and I preached my very first sermon on this particular Sunday and I was absolutely certain that my pastor was trying to do me in before I got started by having me preach about the slaughter of the innocents. How could I make something good out of that? Well, apparently I did. And this is the lectionary verse on this day every year is the slaughtering of the innocents because it follows the Christmas celebrations. And who really wants, after Christmas time, to talk about something as horrible as Herod going into Bethlehem and slaughtering all of the infants? Are we supposed to just simply say from the pulpit, okay folks, you've had a few days of joy and happiness and celebration, now we're going to get back to the real world of pain and suffering and troubles that happen throughout the world. Well, you know, I got through that idea 15 years ago and I've been doing it, and so I suspect today we'll get through it as well. And you know, Christmas is something that some people are sad to see go. Some people by this time have had enough of it and they're ready to move on. One mother said particularly that she hated to see Christmas go because she knew that after Christmas Eve was over and everybody in the family had hung up their stockings, it was the last time for a year they would ever hang up anything. And many of us can be sad to see Christmas go, but that's reality. It does pass. That's the way it is. Thinking of our scripture, Mary and Joseph had had some real good things happen. The Magi came and gave them good words. They gave them all kinds of nice gifts. And then all of a sudden, things turned sour for Mary and Joseph. You see, immediately following the visit of the Magi, Joseph was warned in a dream that Herod was about to search for the child and he wanted to destroy him. 
So with this warning in mind, Joseph took Mary, Joseph and the infant, and fled into Egypt, while Herod, in this rage of fear, and mostly it was fear that he had, more so than the envy, he slaughtered all of the children in Bethlehem. And that's a horrible conclusion to the beautiful Christmas story of the babe in the manger and the love, the slaughter of the innocents. But that's the way life really is. Good oftentimes precedes bad and vice versa. You see, you and I are safe and secure here this morning in our comfortable church, in our homes, where we can feel loved and secure. But we need to be reminded every once in a while that life is not just always a bowl of cherries. We live in a violent world. We live in a world where everybody is not safe. Everybody is not secure. We live in a country where just yesterday, 1.3 million people in America were taken off of receiving unemployment, which could well be their lifeline because they don't know where they're gonna find the resources for themselves and their families in order to exist. You see, most of them have already had their food stamp allotments cut way, way back. And they face the reality of this world that in this country we have over 8 million people today who are unemployed and there are 3.9 million jobs available kind of means, folks, that there isn't going to be a job available for everybody, no matter how bad they want to work and where their skills are. And so we re need to realize in today's world that all of those 1.3 million people are not as they are oftentimes described as being too lazy to work, or as some politicians say, well, if they don't work, the Bible says they don't eat. What about our family that this church adopted? The woman whose husband had left her, she was deaf. Very few jobs available for single deaf women. To top it off, she had three daughters. One who was deaf and had sight difficulties as well. She's part of that. 1.3 million. She's not too lazy to work. She's unfortunate. And there are many like that throughout this world. I grew up during World War II. And I listened to the radio a lot. <clears throat> and the evening news, I was intrigued by an announcer called Gabriel Heater. He was known as the announcer, and I'll never forget the sound of his voice. And I can't duplicate it, but he would say, Ah, yes, there's good news tonight. And he'd talk about the good news, and then he'd talk about the horrors of World War II. And when we read the New Testament, we find that sometimes we do distinguish between the good news and the, good, the news that is not so good. And both of those kind of news are dealt with at the same time, side by side. You see in the Gospel of Luke, the story of the manger scene and the babe appears side by side with a description of universal taxation 
by the occupying forces from Rome. And in Matthew's account of the gospel, there is no attempt at all to hide the fact that Jesus was born at the same time that his tyrant, Herod, was on the throne. A tyrant who would slaughter tiny infants, but always across that manger, the shadow of the cross follows. Simeon saw it first. Mary and Joseph brought young Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. And there they encountered a righteous and devout man named Simeon. The Holy Spirit had promised Simeon at some point <clears throat> that he would not see death until he had witnessed Jesus Christ. And when he saw this baby, as they brought him to be dedicated, he came over and he picked up the baby. And he said, Lord, now let us, though thy servant, depart in peace. Let me depart in peace. Because according to your will, I, my eyes have seen thy salvation, which were prepared for all peoples, a light for revelation for all the Gentiles, and glory for the people of Israel. Then he made a strange and a very disturbing prophecy. He told Mary, a sword will pierce through your soul. Well, Luke doesn't record whether a shudder went through Mary at that time or whether she knew what Simeon was talking about when he said that sword shall pierce through your soul. So you see, the real story of Christmas is one in which both good and evil are shown exactly for what they are. And that's the kind of world we live in. We live in a cruel world where crime, poverty, drug addiction, gangs, hunger, discrimination, and a whole host of evils threaten to overwhelm society and whose evil even impinges upon the kind of secure, happy life that we would provide for those that we love. You know, for me, it's hard to read the paper or to listen to television sometimes without being overwhelmed and asking that question that is so familiar to all of us at one time or another, why God, why God? But it's always been so. <clears throat> John spoke of the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. But the darkness keeps on trying. It's always there. You see, I think it has something to do with the basic human condition. We always face the darkness, and the darkness is always present in one form or another. We're constantly faced with the reality of the human condition. And all of us, each and every one of us as humans, do have the potential within us for good or for evil. We all do. I was very heavily influenced in my studies in the seminary of Christianity by St. Augustine. St. Augustine talks a lot about good and evil, and he credits God for evil, because he said, I believe God created everything, and evil itself is something. So if it exists, it had to be created by God. So God created good and evil, but he gave us the option of which way to go. So we do have within us, each and every one of us, 
the possibility of good or evil. <coughs> and we cannot ignore it. You know, one of the scriptures tells us as Christians, we're talking about the poor just a minute ago and feeding the hungry and the poor as we pray for each and every week. And some people take the opinion that Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you to say, well, there are certain things that are facts of life, you just have to accept them. And the poor are always with you. I happen to choose there's a different approach to that, just as I happen to choose there's a different approach to what we're talking about with the slaughter of the innocents. Well, I'll get to in a minute about it being good. I happen to believe that what Jesus says when he says the poor you will always have with you is don't give up. Keep trying to help those children of mine. Don't give up. And so our human nature really hasn't changed a whole great lot since the time of the Bible. At that time, we could have that beautiful story of the birth of Jesus along with this terrible but real story of the slaughter of the innocents. But there is good news. As the Bible says, and if I were reporting the good news on the radio today, I would act like Gabriel Heater. And I would start off with, ah, uh, yes, there is good news tonight. The good news is that God's eternal sign that the forces of evil will not win. God gave us that. Evil will not win. And that's what this story of the slaughter of the innocents means. Evil will not win. It will never happen. Evil may sit on the throne for a while, but it sooner or later will be overthrown. You know, our world has been through some terrible, terrible tragedies and times when people have forecasted the end is near and the imminent doom. But we've always been successfully restored. You know, take a look at many of the damaged areas by horrendous acts of natures and storms, so much so that people thought they would never ever be restored to life. I remember one time my wife and I were in Hawaii and we were looking at the areas where the volcanoes had erupted and the lava had flown down and it was just thick like tar. And then you looked off to the side and you would see trees beginning to grow and branches beginning to grow out of that old molten lava. The good does come, grow and come out of bad is the symbolism that I got from that. Uh, <clears throat> To me, all of those things point to the fact that God will always win. The Herods of the world will have their moment. They will have their day. But the eternal victory belongs to Jesus Christ. And that conviction is what keeps moving you and I from one Christmas to the next. That's the good news for this Sunday out of this scripture, when we read a terrible story like the slaughtering of the innocents, believing that God will always win is what gives us the hope that is necessary for us to sustain ourselves in our lives as Christians. Without hope, we would be aimless. The gospel writer John wrote about the importance of hope. He wrote, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And we are the recipients of that hope. That's the good news. Living with hope means that we don't have to despair. Yes, we do live in a difficult world. Yes, we all have darkness in our lives at one time or another. We feel like our lives have been shattered and there is no hope. 
And there may be those times when we just don't see any light at the end of the tunnel and we think, is this all? There he is. But then we can look to the beauty of the Christmas story and we can see the beauty and realize that that star of Bethlehem still shines. And as long as that star continues to shine in our life, we know that God will not forsake his own child. No matter how dreary, no matter how scary things may seem at any given moment in our life, you can be assured that God's will will win out and you will escape from Egypt as the scripture says. I have brought my son out of Egypt. I have brought my son and my daughter out of the darkness. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.